Hello, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome. I'm so happy you're here. My name is Hannah and on my channel, I post a lot of anti-MLM content. I like to do deep dives into different MLM companies. I also have MLM top fails videos where we play clips and look at photos and react to them and debunk the crazy things that people in MLMs will say. And then there's videos like this one, MLM horror stories. These are your personal stories that you have sent to me and have given me permission to share in a video. And the purpose of these videos is to give you a space to share your experience and to shed light on the truly, truly insane things that go on inside these companies. If you ever have your own horror story that you would like to send to me, the instructions for how to do that are in the description box of all of my videos. It's very easy. You just send me an email. When I get your email, I set it aside into a special folder. And then when I'm sitting down to film these videos, I pick out a few at random and we react to them together. So with that, let's get into the first story. This one says, hi, Hannah. First of all, thank you so much for your content. I've been really enjoying watching your videos. My story is nowhere near as crazy as some of the ones other people have shared, but I still feel like describing them to you right now. I will start from the very beginning. I was born and raised in Germany. When I was still a child, I remember always being told that Tupperware was bad and that I should try to avoid having my mom invited to some kind of party by another mom. I never really knew why, nor did I think much about it. One time, my mom did get invited to a party light party by a colleague of hers. She took me with her and I had a great time smelling candles and picking something out for myself. I must have been around eight years old. I only remember feeling that my mom was really pressured to buy something. Later on, she told me that she always avoided at these kinds of parties because she didn't want to be pushed to buy overly expensive products. She never said anything about a pyramid structure though, and I never heard of anything like that until much later. Last year, a girl I knew from my exchange year in the States started posting strange fitness content on Instagram. I see where this is going. She started to talk a lot about Shakeology, and I got really confused as to why she would do that. In fact, I'm very interested in health and fitness, which is why I looked up the product. I was shocked that it was so expensive, and looking at the ingredients, I did not see how it would actually live up to the claims being made. Also, the ingredients can be sourced cheaply, so the price really put me off as well. I didn't think about it much until a friend of mine mentioned Kiki Chanel's channel. Needless to say, I became a real anti-MLM addict and started to realize this girl is in a pyramid scheme. Yeah, Kiki Chanel was like my gateway drug into anti-MLM stuff too. Her channel was the first that I saw, and ever since then I've been hooked. The story could end here, but unfortunately it does not. A couple of weeks ago, I saw a friend of my boyfriend's post about a keto coffee, which is burning all of her fat. It works. Her friends have talked to her about how it's a pyramid scheme, but unfortunately she just does not understand. Her response was, it's not a pyramid scheme if we leave early enough. If we leave early enough, I'm not sure what that means. It's not a pyramid scheme if you get into it, make a little bit of money and then don't stay in it for several years. To make matters worse, her English is quite bad, so I can't even have my boyfriend send her any YouTube videos. A couple days ago, she pitched the opportunity on her story and even put the income disclosure statement on her slides. Has she ever looked at it? I highly doubt it. She is slightly overweight and unhappy with her wage, the ideal target. Since joining It Works, she has lost some weight. Normally, I would be happy for her as she's been trying to lose weight for a while, but now she is giving all the credit to the coffee, the body wraps, and the skinny gummies. My boyfriend tried to tell her that her weight loss is caused by a caloric deficit, but the brainwashing has already done the deed. I'm hoping that she will get out of there soon. From my point of view, it doesn't make much sense talking to her as she thinks that everyone against her business is a hater and just does not understand. It would be great if there was a German anti-MLM creator so that I could send her videos from someone outside of her circle, but maybe even an objective point of view would not save her from the brainwashing. It is sad. Anyways, I feel that MLMs are a lot less strong over here than in the States. The girl I told you about is the only one I know involved in an MLM. From your videos, I understand that in the US, it is rare not to know anyone. So I guess I am lucky after all. Thank you for taking the time to read all of this. I wish you all the best. You're not wrong that if you live in the United States, there's a very good chance that you know at least one person in an MLM. I feel like I know several, probably like 10, 15. It is out of control. Okay, everybody is in an MLM, it seems. At least like the people that I follow on social media and the people that I went to high school with and stuff like that. But I do think you bring up a really great point that there needs to be other MLM creators in different languages. If anybody knows of any other creators that speak different languages, please leave them in the comments so that we can use that as a resource. I know obviously there's tons of English speaking anti-MLM creators and I feel like that's because a lot of MLMs are prevalent in English speaking countries. I feel like we especially need more Spanish speaking anti-MLM creators. There has to be some out there, right? If anybody knows of Spanish speaking content creators that do anti-MLM, 
MLM, please tell me. Because in a way it really does put those groups of people that speak another language at more risk. Because these companies can be in a lot of different countries, but there's not necessarily people speaking out on the harm of them in those different languages. So then what happens is you're getting very one-sided view, a very one-sided opinion on this entire thing, and you're only getting the information from the person that's pitching it to you in that language. And it can be very hard for you to do your own research on the other side of it as well. I think that you should feel lucky that you only know about one person in an MLM. I cannot say the same. I'm sure most people in the States can't say the same, but thank you so much for sending in your story and you brought up some amazing points about the need for anti-MLM content in other languages. All right, this next story, it says, hi Hannah, I love watching your channel and it inspired me to share my story because I grew up with MLMs and fell into the trap more than once. That's not uncommon. Lots of people get into several MLMs before they decide to leave the industry as a whole. In fact, watching your channel was the push I needed to finally walk away from the sex toy MLM I was in for the last few years. That makes my heart unbelievably happy. This is a complete little side note. I've recently started a spreadsheet. I have it on my computer and anytime anybody tells me like your video prevented me from joining an MLM or this video prompted me to leave my MLM or this channel kept my sister or my friend out of an MLM or anything like that. I like to know about it. It's very rewarding for me to like keep track of those things on a spreadsheet and to have a visualization of here's the amount of people that I have been able to, I guess, like help in one way or another and prevent them from getting into involved in this industry because of course making these videos is very fun. I really enjoy it. I make a little money doing it, but the ultimate goal for me is to spread awareness and to educate on the harmful effects of this industry. And so to have physical proof that what I'm doing is making a difference in the world that's all that matters to me. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for telling me that. I joined as a side gig to add possible income to my freelance writing gig, but basically wasted about $155 per year on site fees and another $99 on a new kit every year, not including the new catalogs. I don't know if my horror story is as bad as some I've heard on your channel and others, but it was definitely my horror. However, my story starts with my mother. Growing up, my mom was an Avon rep and her upline told her to use what she had, including me, to sell the products door to door. I remember going with my mother to the monthly regional meetings and my mom was very high up in the company in the 1980s. Even at six, I would be honored as being the best little assistant and they would call me up to the front of the room where the leader would talk about how I was such a big help and such a good little sales girl. Ew. I hate that. But when my mom got sick, they dropped her like a bad apple. She was in the hospital to have a lump in her throat removed and missed some meetings and even missed paying whatever fees were associated with her account. And they told her she was being demoted back to the base level in the company. My mom walked away for a few years, but then became a rep again when I was in high school because she just wanted the discount again. She is still technically a rep, but she doesn't sell anything, just buys a few things every few months. Isn't that the craziest thing? That if for whatever reason you do have to take a break from your MLM, whether that be, God forbid, some kind of illness or surgery like this. Maybe you just really want to take a vacation. Maybe your family's going to be in town for 17 days in December, like mine is, which I'm very excited for, but I'm not going to be working during that time. I'm doing all of this ahead of time. I'm pre-filming, pre-uploading everything. But I feel like people in MLMs, they don't have that luxury. They don't have that opportunity to just take a little bit of time off for whatever reason without the risk of being demoted, being kicked out of the group chat being labeled as like lazy or not a hard worker. It's completely ridiculous in my opinion. As a teenager, right around the time my mom went back to Avon, they started their teen division, Mark by Avon, which was geared towards teens and I was considered a legacy. It was awful and I quickly got out of the company because before I was even 18, I was in debt over $400 to the company trying to keep up with having catalogs and bags and samples on hand. Good Lord. To me, this kind of proves what I've been saying in a few of my recent videos that the older an MLM gets, the more they've tapped into the population already and the more they have to rely on underage people or high schoolers or people that are just turning 18 because those are the only people that haven't been pitched yet. That's why you see a lot of MLMs advertising to high schoolers and whatever this is, the teen division in Avon. To me, that just seems like, oh crap, we can't recruit at the same rate we have been because we already asked everybody in the available population. Now we have to result to teenagers. Disgusting. When I turned 18, a classmate in college convinced me to join them at a Cutco meeting. And honestly, it wasn't for me, but they called me and emailed me every day for six straight days 
months. That's called desperation on Cutco's part. Again, tapping into the newly 18 population. It finally stopped when I changed my phone number. I decided to give regular Avon a try though. Paid back the $400 I owed from my time as a Mark rep and honestly wasted so much money all over again getting catalogs and bags and samples. But I didn't want to go door to door and I felt like everyone and their mother was a rep. That's what I'm saying. Plus they were trying to pit me and my mother against each other, even though technically she was my upline. It was awful. Like I said before, she's technically still a rep. When I turned 20, I joined my first sex toy company, Brown Bag Party. I've never heard of that one. I've only heard of Pure Romance, but you said your first company. So maybe you joined Pure Romance later. We'll find out. At first it was interesting because I felt like I was actually making money, but I quickly ran out of friends to host a party. And honestly, I still have no idea how my upline was apparently able to host three to six parties per week because I was usually lucky to get one every week, if not every other week, at least for my first six months. Then it just died away and I was going months without a lead or a party. I mean, yeah, there's only so many people you can host a party for. My goodness, three to six a week sounds like a lot to me. My upline told me I needed to branch out and accept more party leads. And this is where it truly went wrong. I don't drive. And at the time I was still dealing with panic attacks from driving, but I had a friend who said she would be willing to help me. She didn't want to be in the MLM, but she was willing to drive me. And so I accepted a party that was much farther away away. It was an hour away from my house and in the middle of nowhere. So my friend drove me and just asked that I pay for gas. No problem. Very reasonable. But since I didn't set up the party, my upline did. I never felt truly prepared for this party and it was a disaster. It was more of a man bashing event where they wanted to play with the toys, which that's whatever, but it got extremely uncomfortable. And by the end of the night, I had sold $395 in products, which left me with a take home of $158 for five hours. I was expected to be there an hour early to help the hostess set up and I had to stay to help clean up. And that time didn't include the drive there or home. After paying for gas and dinner, because I couldn't not after she sat in the driveway waiting for me for five hours, was she not allowed inside or she just didn't want to? Like, was it her choice to be in the car for five hours? My pay from that party was around $60. My upline convinced me that I should take another Another party right after that in order to keep up my momentum. The problem was that the party was two states away from where I lived. My friend agreed to drive me again. I would pay for gas and dinner. Again, so reasonable and nice. That is such a good friend. I don't think I would ever voluntarily drive someone two states away so that I could like sit in the driveway <laughs> for several hours. After a seven hour drive to get to the party, my hostess tells me that most of her guests have canceled. The party ended up being less than two hours, didn't have to help clean up, which was nice. And only two people placed orders. But one of the women said that she was interested in being a consultant. I don't even remember how much I made, but if it was over $200, I would be shocked. However, the recruit idea was exciting in terms of finally having a downline. The thing is that leaving the party after a seven hour drive and two hours at this party meant it was around 9 p.m. and she didn't want to have to drive seven hours back at night, which made sense. So that night we ended up staying in the area because it was too late to drive back. When I told my friend about the party and the possible recruit, she told me I needed to give her a cut of my recruit pay. It was a disaster after that because about two days after we got back from the party, I learned that the recruit that was supposed to be in my direct downline would instead be my uplines recruit because I didn't have enough sales for the month. That also meant I lost out on the recruit bonus, which I would have received. Oh my goodness gracious, this is a mess. I was with the company for a few more months trying to make up for the disaster of those two long distance parties because I was trying to pay back my friend the money that she had decided I owed her on top of the gas and dinners. Yeah, that's a really uncomfortable situation actually for her to like ask for a cut of your company's money that they're paying you for whatever it was that you did at the party. That would make me very uncomfortable. But before I could even leave the company, they shut down suddenly. Oh, okay. So this first one, it just like poof into thin air gone. It was not only completely unexpected, but tons of people were out money and products. It was a disaster. And I did didn't even find out from my upline because they didn't even know. We found out from an upper level leader on Facebook. And because I had an outstanding party with credit card payments, I ended up losing that money. It wasn't a lot, maybe $79, but at the time that felt like so much money because of everything else going on. Isn't it the wildest thing that 
overnight with a snap of a finger, your MLM can just completely dissolve into nothingness. That is so horrifying to me. Just like all of a sudden, this thing that you're involved in, the thing that you're hoping will make you money, poof, gone, no resolution, no explanation. And you have to find out from somebody's uplines, uplines, upline. Or in the case of Black Oxygen Organics, boo, that just shut down a few weeks ago, they just got an email overnight. Hey guys, just so you know, our company's not a thing anymore. It's crazy. The leader above my direct upline tried to convince me to join their company, which they opened up within a few months of the original company canceling all of our accounts. Although I have heard that Brown Bag Party had restarted operations at some point, but I'm not sure if they are still attempting a reboot or not. Anyway, I agreed to give her new company a try because she was someone who had truly been a success story of Brown Bag Party. And after a few months and even more money lost, I realized this wasn't for me. For a few years, I was out of the business entirely, and then I started getting emails from a rep for Pure Romance. Here we go. I knew it, who felt that I would be a great fit for her team. I wanted no part of it because the compensation plan and investment didn't work for me. And I would like to say I knew better, but in 2014 or so, I ended up joining another sex toy party MLM. The initial investment was 129 for my own website, catalogs, and a kit. After almost seven years, I really only hosted about 12 parties. I had a few online sales over that time, but basically I spent about $1,500 over the course of seven years. I really didn't lose a ton of money, but I really do wish I had that money back in my bank account. Over the years, I would say that I have invested slash lost close to $10,000 on MLM companies with the majority of my wasted money going to brown bag party. I was definitely young and dumb, but I really hope that I've grown up at this point because no more MLMs for me. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. Wow, thank you so much for sending this in. That is crazy. I feel like you definitely had like the cornerstone horror stories of being an MLM, right? Like your company shuts down, you lose a lot of money. It sounds like maybe that friendship was kind of strained because they were offering to drive you, but then also wanted a cut of your profits. All in all, just a big mess, okay? I think you said it several times, what a disaster. But it really is true that a lot of people who are in an MLM, they have to go through several MLMs to realize that it's the business model, it's not them. My impression of it is, is that if you join an MLM and it doesn't work out for you and you're not seeing the results you were expecting out of it, it's very common for you to be like, oh, that's my fault. I wasn't working hard enough or I don't have the client base for this kind of product or the compensation plan doesn't fit well with me. And so what happens is you're like, okay, that one didn't work. Work, but maybe this one will and you move on to another one. I'm just over the moon excited for you that it seems like at this point you're like, okay, it's not me. It's not my work ethic. It's not anything that I had to do with it. It's just the way that it was designed. And it sounds like hopefully MLMs are a thing of your past and we can move forward and only looking up from here. And on to the next one. This one says, hello, Hannah. Thank you for what you're doing in the anti-MLM community. I love watching your videos as I appreciate your poise and eloquence while educating viewers on the subject. You guys are way too sweet. You do not have to give like pleasantries at the beginning of your email. I always read everybody's email start to finish to make sure that I'm not like cutting anything out, but please know you do not have to give compliments or anything like that. It's not required. You don't have to do that. I have two MLM horror stories to share. The first comes from all the way back when I was in high school. I had a good friend, let's call her Eliza, who was a year ahead of me and had just turned 18. She was a very bright student, always had amazing grades and was very friendly and charismatic. One would never know it from looking at her, but she had a very rough home life. Her father was not in the picture and she had a five-year-old little sister who she was basically raising on her own after school because her mother was working three jobs. One day, Eliza gave me an envelope and asked me to bring it to my mom. I wondered what it could be about as she's only ever said hello to my mom in passing when my mom would pick me up after after school. That day I gave my mom the envelope and she opened it in front of me. Inside was a very politely written letter from Eliza asking if my mom would allow her to come over after school one day so that she could do a presentation for the new company she would joined as a sales rep. It was Cutco Knives. <laughs> oh my god. What am I telling you about Cutco freaking preying on 18 year olds? It's horrible. My mom was so impressed by Eliza's professionalism, she wrote a note back inviting her to come over. I didn't think anything of it because as a mere teenager, I had no idea what an MLM was and I didn't know anything about Cutco. Most high schoolers don't, which is exactly how they get ya. The next week, Eliza drove to our house after school and my mom and I were both sympathetic that she had brought along her little five-year-old sister. We'll call her Haley, okay. Haley 
and Eliza. Of course, since Eliza's mom was never around, Eliza had to drag poor Haley with her to every demonstration she did at people's houses. I'll never forget how saddened my heart was when Eliza came into our house carrying her case full of products and paperwork with her little sister's hand in tow. <laughs> This makes my heart really, really sad. I don't know why. She looked very embarrassed and she quietly asked my mom if Haley could have a glass of milk because she was very thirsty and she had forgotten to bring along her juice box. My mom with her bleeding heart not only gave Haley a glass of milk, she also gave her an entire sleeve of Ritz crackers and a couple cookies too. I was so distracted the entire time Eliza gave her demonstration at our dining room table. But the one thing I remember was watching her cut the penny in half with a knife to showcase how sharp it was. Hmm, that's kind of impressive. <laughs> Actually. <laughs> of course, my mom bought an entire block set of Cutco knives that day because she felt so bad. Many years later, I learned about how Cutco recruits young salespeople before they're even out of high school. And it made me pity Eliza's situation even more. She was probably so desperate to help out her family because they were struggling financially. She felt like she had no choice but to say yes to this opportunity. I never knew how long she stayed with Cutco because we lost touch after she graduated. My second horror story happened when I was in my mid twenties and I was much more aware of MLMs and how they operated. I had recently grown close to a coworker of mine, we'll call her Maria, who had a six month old baby girl. Her baby was unplanned and she had just gotten married to her boyfriend a few months prior. They lived in a tiny apartment and her husband had to work two jobs to make ends meet. This will be important later. So Maria and I had both gotten invited by our mutual coworker to a party at her house. We agreed to go, except for the chance to see some of our coworkers outside of work on a Saturday afternoon, go eat food and hang out. Maria even brought along the baby. Little did we know we were in for an unpleasant surprise. It was a Norwex party. The sales representative gave me icky vibes instantly when she introduced herself to us. We'll call her Annie. Her presentation was Interesting. The only thing I remember from it was the part where she laid a piece of raw chicken on a cutting board, wiped it with a wet Norwex cloth and licked it to prove how much she trusted the cloth's ability to remove harmful bacteria. It was bizarre. That's just disgusting. Okay, why are we doing that? Why are we licking raw chicken? I am severely grossed out by that right now. Oh my God. After the presentation, Annie had us play a game where we had to flip over these cards and find out what our prize was. Both Maria and I were lucky enough to pick the host a Norwex party as our prize. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else wrote in a story just like this too. They played a game and their prize was that they had to host a party in the future. So uncomfortable. How is that a prize? Who wants that? Nobody wants that. I remember pretending to be excited in front of the seven other ladies who were there. Meanwhile, inwardly cringing and thinking of how I was going to get out of it. Annie then had every one of us sit with her one-on-one -on -one at the dining room table so she could find the Norwex products that best meet our needs and also schedule a party for those of us who had to host one now. <laughs> So funny. I watched in disgust as Annie forcefully tried to get Maria to first schedule the Norwex party, to which Maria bashfully admitted she didn't have room in her tiny apartment to have a party and she would be too embarrassed to have people over. Oh, that breaks my heart. I could literally see tears in Maria's eyes, but that didn't stop Annie. Annie then tried to push Maria to buy a bunch of products, subtly shaming her while she held her crying baby, saying things like, don't you want to avoid all the harsh chemicals of other cleaning products around your baby? I know these are a little pricier, but they're going to do a massive favor for your health. I couldn't take it, so I stepped in to politely tell Annie that Maria was in a situation where she truly couldn't afford it right now, and I would buy something for her instead. I ended up spending close to $90 on products that I secretly knew would be collecting dust in the trunk of my car for a year. I'm horrified by that image of a new mom who's financially struggling, and she's having someone try and picture these products and like corner her into buying them. It's mind blowing. The lengths that people in MLMs will go to, to make a sale. It's almost that like common courtesy, common boundaries, common respect for other humans doesn't apply. They have one goal in mind, one purpose for this interaction, and they will say and do whatever they need to do to break you down and convince you to buy the products. Once I finished buying the products, Annie asked me when I would be scheduling the Norwex party at my house. I told her the truth that I was still living with my parents at the time and out of respect for them, I would have to ask their permission before hosting a Norwex party. Annie was not 
happy with this answer. She continued for 20 minutes to hassle me and push me into at least putting a date on the calendar because your mom won't have to do anything to host the party because you're the one who is the host. I finally relented and picked a random date knowing I'd be canceling it later. She took down my contact info and we all went home. Again, with the relentless breaking you down until you have no choice, it's terrible. Not even a day later, Annie texted me asking if I'd gotten my mom's permission to throw the party on the date we'd picked. I told her, no, I'm sorry, but my mom is not okay with me having the party at our house. Then Annie had the gall to ask me, when do you think you'll be finding a place of your own? I would love to help you host a party then. I didn't even reply. Wow. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I'm not even exaggerating. I continued to get text messages from Annie every couple of months for three years afterward. Relentless. Things like, hey, it's Annie from Norwex. Just checking in to see how you like your products. Ready to host that party yet? What other dangerous household products are you ready to say goodbye to forever? I never replied to her no matter how many times she texted me. I was shocked she didn't give up on me sooner. By then I'd gotten a new job and I ended up giving away the dumb Norwex products I bought to the receptionist at my new office because she was looking for cloths to clean her computer keyboard with. <laughs> The saga ended when Annie eventually stopped texting me and I thought I'd escaped Norwex forever. Then the very next Christmas, we had a white elephant gift exchange at my in-laws house. I opened my random gift and ta-da, a Norwex gift set. I had to laugh. Seems like everyone is trying to get rid of those stupid products. <laughs> Thanks for reading and I look forward to the other horror stories in your next video. Wow, what a good story. That one made me laugh. I mean, you said it all. I don't have anything to really add other than they're just relentless. They will not give up. And as annoying and frustrating and sad as it is, you have to remember that it's coming from a place of desperation on their end. And they're so deeply involved with this scheme and they truly believe that if they just work hard enough or if they just push you hard enough that they can truly see the financial success that they were promised. And wow, is it annoying, right? Wow, is it frustrating? I'm very sorry that you had to be on the receiving end of that because for three years, that's insane. Okay. She was deep into this MLM. All right. The next story says, hello, Hannah. I just wanted to say up front that I came for the Poshmark and stayed for the anti MLM. I love that. My story is not so much a horror story since nothing has really been cringy, but I am surrounded by MLMs on all fronts and some I do like and use the products, but most I just kind of smile and nod. It should first be said that I live in Utah and I'm a member of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In this culture, it is taught for you to be self-sufficient as much as possible. So it's a veritable breeding ground for work from home MLMs. You can't throw a rock without hitting and then bouncing into at least three different ones. Personally, in my immediate family, I have Mary Kay, Tupperware, Usborne Books, and Lavelle. I don't know if it's Usborne or Usborne. Who knows? And in the years past, these same people have also done Paparazzi, Lip Sense, Cutco, Leah Sophia, I haven't heard of that one, doTERRA, Arbon, and an Idaho local one, Damsel in Defense, which I think is arguably the best one. Okay, I have no idea what that is. What it sounds like to me, I have no idea what this is, but here's what I like to believe it is. Is it an MLM that sells like personal defense items, like alarms and pepper spray and things like that? It also sounds like that would be a really good name for like a martial art studio, <laughs> damsel in defense, like women going in and taking classes on like personal defense. I think that's a great idea. I must know. I must look this up. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. It is like pepper sprays, stun guns, things like that. Okay. And they're cute too. These are like cute products. I would totally buy it if it wasn't an MLM. I've never been pushed to join up with any of them, thankfully, but I feel like I can't talk about or try a competing brand of anything without being told how much better their product is. I like makeup and skincare, and I've been trying to clear my adult acne with various products for a couple years now to varying degrees of success. But every time I mention that I'm trying something new and heaven forbid I don't like it, my mom, the Mary Kay rep, asks if I've tried their product that supposedly does the same thing. And I have nothing against Mary Kay products and I've used a ton of them myself, but they aren't the golden rule of skincare or makeup. Okay, that's all. Thanks for letting me put that out there. After watching your videos, I want to sit them all down and pin their eyelids open to watch a la clockwork orange. <laughs> 
<laughs> I've never seen that movie, but here's a picture of what you're referencing. You bring up a wonderful, wonderful point that especially in Utah and especially in the LDS community, MLMs are rampant. My husband was raised LDS. A lot of his side of the family is. A lot of my friends are LDS. A lot of my friends that are LDS are also in MLMs. There is an incredible tie between the two that I think is very fascinating. And actually on Roberta Blevins podcast, it's called Life After MLM. There is a two part episode. It's episode nine and episode 10, where she has a man named Ryan McKnight come on and talk about the connection between Mormonism and multi-level marketing. It is unbelievably fascinating. And he's speaking from the perspective of somebody who was LDS and he's also very respectful. If anybody out there watching this is interested in this connection, I would more than recommend those two episodes. I can link them down below. Your mind will truly be blown about all of the connections. And I feel like I can confirm what you're saying that living in Utah and being a member of that community absolutely lends itself to being more overly exposed to MLMs than any other place in the US, I would say. Especially because a lot of MLMs are also headquartered there. This next story says, hi Hannah, this MLM sighting never sat right with me and I think you will enjoy this perspective. Okay. In college, I competed in rodeo queen pageants and competitions. I was fortunate enough to make it to the big leagues and compete in a national pageant. I won't reveal the name, but think Miss America, but for rodeo queens. Okay, cool. Like most pageants, sponsorships were a big deal and were necessary to keep the title going. This particular pageant has some large corporate sponsorships behind them. They're very reputable, but it wasn't until until I was at the actual pageant that I learned about the sponsorships provided by both Senegents, also known as Lipsense, and Monate. No way. Oh my God. I assume they were sponsored by individual representatives, but if so, they were spending a lot of money to get these spots. Our goodie bags included both Lipsense and Monate hair care in them. We were judged on modeling with sponsored products, including Monet and Lipsense. These photos were allowed to be used for marketing purposes for sponsors. Somewhere out there is a photo of me smiling with a bottle of Monet with $200 extensions in. I probably could have said no, but definitely would have seen that reflect on my scores. This is crazy. I'm just envisioning you like with beautiful hair, not at all related to Monet, but you're like posing with this product. Oh my God. God. The kicker for me was the winner had to post about these sponsorships on social media throughout their year long reign. They were given a year long supply of Senegens makeup and Monate hair care, along with all their super nice and normal sponsored products. If they were asked what shampoo they used, they had to say Monate. Same goes with makeup. They had to say Senegens. They could not be seen putting on any lip product other than lip scents. The reps could also use the winner's image for any marketing purposes they needed. That was the point when I began to question if I wanted to win anymore. There was a long running joke amidst the girls who held the title about the after the crown cut, meaning at the end of their year reign, they had to cut their hair off due to being overly damaged and lifeless. In hindsight, I fully know why. Luckily, I did not win. That did not stop the sponsor distributors from reaching out to me to join their team. I ignored every call, email, and text. Even before I was fully educated on MLMs, they seemed off to me. Although not a super duper horror story, it's interesting to see another extra expense that these reps lost towards their business and how once again, they manipulated young girls into being contractually obliged to promote below par chamois products with absolutely no kickback. Thanks for being the best. What an incredibly entertaining story that is. So let me get this straight. You don't think that it was the companies themselves that paid to have those sponsorship spots? You think it was like specific reps from those companies that paid their own money to do that? Because that that is wild. And I love this. Contractually obliged to promote below par chamois products with absolutely no kickback. How is that really different than being in the company itself, right? Some people make a kickback, but most people don't. Incredible, beautifully written. I love, love, love this story. And with that, that's all of the stories that I have for this video, but do not worry. I am growing my folder of MLM horror stories every single day. It is so exciting. I'm gonna try and make these videos longer and longer and include more and more stories in each one. I can never have too many stories. Please keep sending them to me again. The directions for how to do that are in the description down below. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you and I will see you in my next one real soon.